Well, good evening. Welcome. It's uh, Sunday the 23rd of July, and uh, we come to our ninth in the series Sharpened by Grace, as we're exploring practical Christian living through the lens um, of Romans 12. And, uh, just seeing the wealth of practical instruction, uh, particularly about relationships that the Apostle Paul pens down for us. So we come this evening uh, to consider the theme of being fired up and I trust that will be a blessing. But again, folks, let me just read the entire little mini section that we're looking at in uh, great depth. Just working clause by clause. I think it's always useful just to have that wash over us again. So if uh, you are following along in your Bibles, won't you read with me uh, from Romans chapter 12, picking up at verse 9 through to the end of the chapter, verse 21. And uh, well, the book ends in verse 9 and 21 and everything else is in a, in a sense the meat in the proverbial sandwich. But let's Hear the word of God together, then pray, and then we can dive into what I trust you would want to be saying to us this evening. <clears throat> Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. But with that in mind, let's bow together in prayer. And again, just plead for the help of the Spirit as we come to tackle this passage of Scripture this evening. Let's uh, pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of another Lord's Day to rest and recover and renew and to be revitalized for the work week that lies ahead. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we had this morning to be together in corporate worship, enjoying the fellowship even in the context of the service and afterwards and through Bible Hour. And Lord, as we gather together on this virtual platform at the end of another Lord's Day, Lord, we do pray for your help to keep us alert and focused uh, that we would be attentive to what you are saying to us, both individually and as a local church. And again, Lord, as we prayed this morning in light of Isaiah 55, cause your word as it goes out this evening. And as we reflect on that this evening, not to return to you uh, in vain. And we know that it will accomplish that for you purpose and will succeed in that particular way. So, Lord, we do pray through the power of the Spirit of God come and uh, do your way in every single one of us so that we are both confronted and shaped by what we have to say. And even more so this evening, Lord, we do pray that we would be stirred to pray biblically shaped prayers for ourselves and for our ministries. But come, teach us and guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. There was a young man that attended our church for many years that I had contact uh, with over the years of youth ministry and so forth. And uh, he prided himself in terms of his life motto. Whenever I asked, what, what are you actually living for? His comeback would be, Ignorance and apathy. Ignorance and apathy summed up his life's purpose. And when pushed on that, uh, his uh, repost was quite simply, I don't know and I don't care. Ignorance and apathy. And apathy is really just a, a state of being where you do absolutely nothing. It's uh, really, it's one of the areas in terms of life where one doesn't have to actively sin. You don't have to actively think about something. You don't need to actively go and do something in a particular way. You just quite simply do nothing. Um, and that is the heart of laziness or uh, being a sluggard that the Bible talks about. People that are existing in that space of apathy and laziness are really caught up in a pattern of total inertia. There's no movement in their lives. There's no momentum. They're not going anywhere. It's not necessarily that they're doing anything wrong, except for the fact that they're doing absolutely nothing. And uh, that's actually the issue. And uh, the Bible talks about that in, in general life, doesn't it? Uh, we read, for example, in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 9, 
How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? And Solomon's pretty much saying, just get up and actually do something. The results of that are seen as well through Proverbs. If we go, for example, to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24, we read, the hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be, pers- uh, will be put to forced labor. Uh, so those that are diligent and productive and uh, actually doing something and will have the opportunity of taking leadership positions and actually uh, being rewarded in that way. But the slothful uh, are the ones that actually end up subjugated and under the control of others, largely. In Proverbs 20, verse 4, we read, The sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest, but have nothing. If you don't sow anything, you're not going to reap anything. If you don't get up out of your bed and into your fields and actually do some plowing and do some scattering. Uh, when it comes time to, har- uh, to harvest or harvest time, there's isn't very little to gather, if not anything. This is such a wonderful set of Proverbs in Proverbs 26, verse 13 and 14. The sluggard says there is a lion in the road. There is a lion in the streets. And effectively, they're just making up their own little dream world. They're looking for excuses not to do anything. I can't possibly go outside. There's danger. There's a threat. Something might hurt me. It's easier to stay inside in my bed where it's safe with my wife beater vest and my packet of Simba chips and my hand in that and actually just feed my face. But I can't go outside because I, I might get eaten by the line or I might get run over by a taxi or I might be whatever excuse you actually want to put to that. So the slogan is an excuse maker. But this has got to be one of my favorite word pictures in Scripture. In the very next verse, in Proverbs 26, verse 14, as a door turns on its hinges, so turns a sluggard on his bed. I think the King James is even better. As a door turneth upon its hinges, so turneth a sluggard upon his bed. You just get that sense of that door swinging. Squeak, squeak, squeak. But it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't do anything. It just goes from that side to that side going squeak. And that's all the sluggard does. I'm on my left-hand side, and oh, there's a line outside. It's cold. It's wet. I can't do anything today. I know I should be going to church, but I'll just squeak over onto my right-hand side and uh, carry on having a little bit of a doze under the duvet. As the door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. And those aren't on particularly in terms of church life and ministry, are they? That's just life in general, and uh, I guess we know people like that and God's word certainly confronts us in that issue of inertia and being apathetic and being lazy. We're called to be productive, we're called to work, we're called to be involved in activities. But the same principles could be extended to church and ministry. They're not restricted in terms of a general sense and I think we could bring that down and we should bring it down to local church life this evening. How often do we see apathy around us? And this is not in any way casting stones or pointing fingers, but we just want to be have an honest discussion about this this evening. How often do we see laziness when it comes to church life and involvement and ministry and serving and uh, folk being willing to get their hands dirty in a particular way? How often do we hear excuse making? I can't possibly because of, I don't know, pick a, pick a reason. I need some me time. Um, or I need to go to a family brunch, or it's my granny's birthday in Pretoria at uh, one o'clock this afternoon, and I can't possibly come to a nine o'clock worship service. Look, I've heard them all, trust me. I, I, if I had a little black book, it would, I'd be on to my kind of second or third volume, I think, in terms of some of the, quite frankly, pathetic excuses that are made in terms of I can't, I won't, etc. Uh, but we live with those realities. Uh, we live with the reality, sadly so, of unreliability where somebody just slacks and skips and fails to do something, and somebody else in the heat of the moment, in a sense, needs to pick up the role or pick up the duty or pick up the responsibility. And uh, then when you confront the person, it's like, a, oops, I forgot. Was I actually meant to be involved in that particular task today? Oh, so what? Who cares? Somebody else did it. And actually it all falls forms part of the sluggard inertia, laziness, excuse-making, complacency picture that we actually see described for us in God's Word. Well, focus, we narrow our focus down to Romans chapter 12. We've already seen Paul's exhortation in terms of ministry and the use of gifting. And we saw that earlier on in chapter 12 in verses 4 through to 6, where Paul says, 
for as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function so we though many are one body in christ and individually members of one another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us don't miss it let us use them we're called to use our gifting and then he goes into the various gifts prophecy and so forth that follow in the verses that follow the point is paul has already confronted us in this chapter about the reality that there is no room in the christian life for passivity and for apathy and for complacency there is no space for shink, uh, shinking, slinking into the shadows the new testament summons the believer to work and to serve and to be involved now paul loops back to that exact issue in verse 11 of the same chapter having already laid the foundation of gifting and the need to use them what does he say there in verse 11 this is going to be our focus uh, for the duration of our time this evening listen to verse 11 from chapter 12 do not be slothful in zeal be fervent in spirit serve the lord do not be slothful in zeal be fervent in spirit serve the lord folk i can't come with some great alliterated outline the roadmap is there. We are three issues, and we just want to confront them one after the other and just tackle it as it lies in the text in front of us and see how there are different facets in the sense of the same issue. So instruction number one or challenge number one, rather, for this evening is do not be slothful in zeal. To be slothful is exactly what we've looked at, to be idle, to be lazy, to shrink back from certain duties and responsibilities. There is a very real sense in that idea of being slothful uh, with timidity and fear. Uh, can I really do it? Should I really do it? Can I really get involved? Maybe somebody else will do it. Maybe I'm not good enough to do it. What will somebody say if I get it wrong? Again, folk, I've, I've heard all of those, and uh, they're used in uh, very creative ways to duck and dive on responsibility. But Paul says, do not be slothful, in other words, shrinking back with timidity in zeal. And zeal goes to the heart of being eager, of being devoted, of jumping in uh, and of doing, uh, doing, doing one's best in a particular area. And so if we had to paraphrase just that first clause, what the Apostle Paul effectively is saying to us is, don't shirk from what you should eagerly be doing as a Christian. That's effectively my paraphrase. And I think it gets to the heart of the issue. Don't shirk from what you should be doing eagerly as a Christian. People that heed that, are gems within church life deirdre loves people like that when an appeal is sent out or something is asked to be done and uh, there is there are hand, kind of hands that spring up with alacrity it's like a a spring built into people's hands they're they're responding to the email almost as soon as they've got that or responding in terms of uh, the, the the whatsapp that is sent out i love it as well uh, i've said to in jest over the years sometimes you just want to find the mold of someone and replicate them there's just such willingness and joy and eagerness to get involved i've said in jest to a few folk over the years as well if you've got a twin brother or a twin sister please send them because we need more like you there is just a zeal to jump in and to help and to serve and to shoulder the load and to assist wherever that is needed and to to pick up the slack in terms of church life and folks, that's what we're called to. This is not a guilt trip this evening. Uh, the New Testament is clear. Paul is clear. The Holy Spirit uh, illuminates our eyes to see a very, very clear instruction. Do not be slothful in zeal. It's not, I'm not coming to this with any agenda this evening. But see what we're called to. We're not called to sit on the sidelines. Church, I've got a wonderful book on my shelf. I think it's written by a British guy. And it's called Church is Not a Spectator Sport. That's the issue. We're to be involved in terms of using our gifting. And there is no room for shrinking into the shadows. There is no sense of a, I wish uh, our church had a, and you can fill in the blank there in terms of whatever it is. And uh, I'm not willing to actually initiate that or do that. And uh, sometimes I've, I've even had those conversations with people or the comments have been dropped. You know, it would be wonderful if the Randwick Baptist Church had a dot, dot, dot. And I'm thinking, we don't, but why don't you initiate that? You could plan it. You could organize that. You could uh, throw some things together and actually do that. 
But uh, we rather sit on the sidelines and throw the comment, I wish we could. And if we don't, well, we'll go somewhere else uh, that does in a particular way. It's uh, really quite frustrating, quite frankly. And there is no sense as we read this phrase of sitting in a meeting uh, with the proverbial mouthful of teeth and the things that need to get done and the duties to be allocated and so forth. And the folk are just so reluctant and always waiting for somebody else to jump in and do something or do anything uh, at all. And I think what we're seeing here just from that clause is a challenge for enthusiasm and involvement and in a realistic, wise way that doesn't you know, overburden us and burn us out to just dive in where we can. And I think that's what we're called to. The reality is, though, that we do get tired. We do get weary. And life is hard. We're all working in various spaces and uh, come to our church time and ministry time oftentimes are ready with the tanks depleted after long days and after long weeks, etc. I mean, those are realities. I'm, I'm certainly sensitive to that. I mean, I, I, I've got the joy. I only work on Sundays, so the rest of this is the rest of the other six days in the week I get to recharge. I mean, if you don't have that privilege, so, uh, you know, I can't speak from experience in that way, but I recognize the reality in your lives of, of the tiredness. But even when we do, what did we see last, last year in Galatians? Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good. That's what the Lord calls us to. It's going to be hard. Uh, certainly the tanks are, are running dry at times, but don't grow, grow weary of that. We're called to good works. And I think there's a sense of uh, energy that we can certainly be uh, working in that way. And, and, and at the same time, for, don't, don't in any way think this is about our own, how shall I say this, resources or and we're trying to work up our own energy. And Paul, as he writes there in the Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, and the folk that were with uh, us yesterday for the youth training will remember how Rory Bell actually uh, touched on that verse in the very first session. Colossians 1, verse 28, Paul says, Him we proclaim, that's Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. But it's verse 29 that I want to draw your attention to. For to this end I toil struggling, that's agonizomai, that's a, there's a sense of agony involved in that as well, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul knows it's a struggle. Um, ministry is hard now, for all of us in various ways. But praise God, we don't do it in our own strength. We do it with the strength God provides. We struggle with all his energy that he powerfully works within me so that we can not grow weary of doing good, so that we, we don't have to be slothful in terms of zeal. All right, so that's the first clause. Do not be slothful in zeal. How does Paul follow that up? Secondly, be fervent in spirit. Be fervent in spirit. Be fervent is to, to boil, to bubble. It's that sense of uh, the pot on the stove that is just bubbling over. Uh, if you want a good story about things bubbling over, ask Carmen about what happened with hot chocolate at last on Friday. I think the church kitchen may recover at some stage, and Norman may forgive us at some stage. But there was a sense of boiling over and bubbling, and it was the most fervent hot chocolate bubbling that you've ever seen in your life before on the gas stove. But the point is this. Well, that's the picture that we need to see. That sense of bubbling energy. And where, do we, where are we called to exercise that? In our spirit, in our inner man. Uh, it could be... If you're using the English Standard Version, you might see be fervent in spirit, and it might suggest you the Holy Spirit. But, folk, I think the, the context certainly suggests an inner boiling, an inner bubbling, an inner enthusiasm. And quite frankly, what the Lord is saying to us in that second clause is just keep your spiritual fervor. Keep the levels high. Do whatever you can in terms of keeping bubbling. And I guess the question then is how? Um, how? When I feel tired, when I'm uh, not deprived when I'm depleted. That's the word that I'm looking for. How do we actually do that? And folk, again, it's what I prayed this morning. Our sufficiency is in Christ. We're united to him by faith. It's all his power through the ministry of the spirit that is energizing us. Our life, our substance, our vitality flows from him. Isn't that the picture of John 15 with the of the vine? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot be a fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. 
For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the issue. As we're abiding in Christ, loving Christ, remaining in him, tapping into the life-giving sap and sustenance that is found in a real relationship with Jesus, there is energy and fruitfulness and productivity that actually flows from us. Along with that, connect with God's people. Stay connected to them. Be stirred up by fellow Christians. Uh, we are the chocolate briquettes in the fire. And if we remove ourselves from the fire, very quickly we're going to go cold. We need people to be involved in our lives, to stir us up, to spur us on towards love and good deeds. Look, it is a sad, sad reality. And I think we've seen it, and maybe you've even been there yourself. But when people feel low, when they feel tanked out, what do they do oftentimes? They distance themselves from fellowship. They distance themselves from corporate worship. I'm too tired. Life is too hard. I don't want to face people. I just need to rest. Uh, again, that vintage phrase, I need some me time. No, you don't. You need people. You need God's people. They are God's gifts to you to stir you up to fellowship together with you, to run the race with you, to, 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 to lift up the drooping hands in Hebrews 12, to, to strengthen the feeble knees, to keep you going. And when you're at your weakest and lowest and most vulnerable, get together with God's people. I had attended a discussion group on a Thursday, and it hadn't been for ages, and uh, we were just talking about a, a book that we're working through on Baptist ecclesiology, um, and uh, uh, Charles the Kivet was present. Uh, Charles is at uh, Pretoria Central Baptist Church. And towards the tail end of this discussion, we were just talking about church life, body life. And the question was asked in the group uh, about uh, grieving people and this issue. Uh, when people are grieving, how they remove themselves oftentimes for a week or two weeks or three weeks or three months uh, from, from fellowship. And I uh, really just appreciated Charles's input on that because it was probably less than a year ago, I guess. Uh, his wife, Carol, died after a long chronic, uh, well, not in fact, it wasn't even that long, but uh, just a very debilitating illness where she lost all communication and speech, uh, et cetera, and eventually died. And uh, he just shared that the most precious thing with his family was to, to, to get together on the very next Sunday with God's people, the family of God. And even though they sat at the back just with tears streaming down their, their cheeks, in a sense, in terms of the brokenness and the pain after Carol's death, there was such a connectedness and a need to be ministered to by people and through the ministry of the word. And I just thought that is such a great example. Instead of running from, run to and enjoy the blessings that uh, we actually have uh, having that way. And isn't that what we're called or what the Bible calls us to? Let us consider how to stir one another up towards love and good works, not neglecting to meeting, uh, meeting together as, in, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. So folk, be fervent in spirit. Utilize the word, utilize people, but uh, let's keep stirred up. And then thirdly, quickly, what's the third phrase? Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord is basically referring to a slave or a servant. It means that we're controlled by Christ. We're under his lordship. We've been bought by him. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. We will glorify God with our body. And that's exactly the issue. We confess Christ as Lord to be saved, but then we keep submitting to him as Lord. And we're under his authority. He calls the shots in terms of what he wants us to be doing. And I think we need to, to recognize that. So how do we serve the Lord? I think we do it through a life that is committed to him. Are we truly living for him? Uh, do we look at church life um, as something for us and for our benefit and for our enjoyment, God forbid, or, or for him? Uh, is church life a means to glorify him through our involvement? And folks, we need to be reminded of that again and again and again and again, that we exist for him, for his purposes, for his use, for his glory. There was a song released right back in 1982, and some of you might remember that. I can clearly remember the, the late James Wood. Uh, when he was an elder at Randburg, uh, coming and asking us to sing that, but it never really caught on. We, we tried it once or twice, and many, many, many years after it was released. But uh, it was uh, released in 82 by Mal Mark Oldrog, or Oldtrog. I want to serve the purpose of God in my generation. I want to serve the purpose of God while I am alive. I want to give my life for something that will last forever. Oh, I delight, I delight to do your will. I think that sums up this issue in terms of our... Uh, 
need to be serving the Lord with faithfulness, serve the Lord in terms of a life that is committed to him. And again, folks, just to round, round up, uh, let's look back to the gifting. I think we serve the Lord through the use of our gifting, um, as uh, we've already seen earlier in the chapter. Uh, just to add to that, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as, go as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God and whoever serves as one who serves with the strength that God supplies so that God might be glorified in everything through Christ. But that's the issue. Whether you've got a speaking gift and are preaching or teaching or leading worship or a Bible study or uh, singing or whatever the case might be, do that faithfully. And if you've got a serving gift in terms of whatever, flowers, tea, support ministry, uh, whatever the case might be, uh, let's do that in a way that uh, is honoring to the Lord in the strength that he supplies. But use our gifting, serve the Lord in those particular ways. The old hymn lyrics of Francis Havergal, I think, are quite germane here. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my kin. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Folk, as we wrap up, this is not a big stick to cajole us this evening. Remember the context, the big hook in, on which all of this is hanging. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to him as an act of spiritual worship. All of this is hanging on God's mercy. He saved us by his grace. He showed you mercy. He saved you. And so in response to that, as a believer, you and I are fueled to action. This is loving God in action because he has first loved us. I don't come with this as a shambok to beat this evening, but to say, look at what you have in Christ. And in response to that, be motivated to not be slothful in zeal, but to be fervent in spirit and indeed to serve the Lord. Alistair Begg, as he taught on this passage, said the following, quote, We are not energized by a consideration of what we are doing for God, but we are actually energized when we think about what God has done for us. That's the issue. Dwell on him, dwell on the gospel, dwell on what you have, and be stirred. Don't sink into the shadows. Don't stand on the sidelines throwing the little stones. Come and join us in the trenches, shoulder to shoulder, serving the Lord, not slothful in zeal uh, and faithfully using our gifting to build our church, to build his kingdom, and ultimately to glorify his name. And let's pray. So we come to pray right now that indeed as a church, that we would be fired up to serve him and his church as he so empowers us in those particular ways.